Hello and welcome to Financial Markets Microstructure. This is lecture number three. In the previous class, we were talking about liquidity, what it is, how to measure it, and why we care about it. The previous two lectures have been very broad and uh, had a general overview on the class. The remainder of the class can be separated in three broad parts. And um, the remainder of the class will be more specific, more particular, focus on particular issues. In the first part of the remaining class, we will be setting up the models with which we will be working on, um, which we will then apply to the more particular issues. These models will be mathematical models designed to represent some relevant aspects of the financial markets. And this will take us about five lectures. One problem set was assigned as a logical conclusion to this part of the course. The second part of the course will deal with applying these models that we introduce to investigate specific issues uh, pertaining to financial markets, such as is fragmentation of financial markets good or bad? What are the costs and benefits of this? What about the transparency in financial markets? Who wins and who loses from different kinds of transparency? The same applies to value of liquidity and the interconnections between liquidity and corporate policy. This part of the course will take about three and a half lectures. And problem set two deals as a logical conclusion to this second part. Finally, the third part of the course will go beyond the textbook and uh, we'll look at some more specific topics, some issues that are not covered in the textbook but that are still highly relevant to um, modern financial markets. These topics include digital markets, algorithmic and high frequency trading, issues relating to public information, which uh, we will allude to today, and the issues dealing with bubbles and uh, herding in financial markets. Finally, there will be one extra class, uh, not really weaved into the rest of the class, which will talk about auction models. This was a last minute addition in the course. Um, and this is still relevant to financial markets, but as I said, this is not well integrated into the rest of the class. So let us begin with part one in this, um, in this schedule. So today we will be talking about the relation between information and prices. In particular, how is information reflected in prices? What is informational efficiency? And we will introduce our first model which explores these issues. This will be Gloston Milgram's model of information-based trading. And this will be our first model, which we will explore the bid-ask spread. It will give us the first way in which bid-ask spread can arise within the markets endogenously, as a result of conscious decisions of the traders. So this is the broad plan for today. Basically, there are two parts. Let us begin with the yet another general discussion of information and prices. Now, in the real world, stock prices move around all the time. If you look at stock price graphs, they are very, very fine, very precise. There are a lot of, there's a lot of movement, a lot of volatility for any actively traded asset. And the question is, what drives these stock price changes? If you look at the media, financial news, then uh, these media reports are full of exposed, exposed rationalizations. They say the prices went up because this, or prices went down because this. Uh, one example is mentioned in the reading list. This is a CNN money report on mobile game uh, companies. But if you sometimes get the feeling that these can be pretty arbitrary, then you may or may not be right. 
human brain is very good at rationalizing stuff exposed, so you can give any explanation to anything. And this has been elevated to a ridicule, sometimes, oftentimes. And uh, there is a Twitter account called Stonks Going Up 1, which basically combines a random direction for stock prices, up or down, with a random news headline. A serial killer let loose. Or the city of Cincinnati installs new traffic lights. So it's, it's difficult to gauge from news alone what is really the fundamental driver of uh, stock prices. So let us ask the question of what does actually determine stock prices? How are the prices formed? Now, in this course, we take the perspective that everybody in the market agrees on assets' uh, future cash flows, which approximates the uh, asset value. We'll talk about that in a couple of slides. So, broadly speaking, traders will have three different reasons for trading in the market, for buying or selling the asset. The first one is risk. For example, if I'm employed in education, which is a very counter-cyclical industry, um, then I would like to invest in some pro-cyclical assets, in stocks of companies working in pro-cyclical industries, uh, to ensure my income. Right. So from the fact that I am buying or selling one of those assets, market can infer that I am doing so because I need to form that risk profile in my portfolio. And this incentive is only relevant to me, so the market will not change its valuation of the asset if it had this information, that I am trading to get this risk profile. The same applies to the second reason for trading, which is funding liquidity. And this is a test for you to remember whether you remember what funding liquidity is from the past lecture. Funding liquidity deals with um, economic agents needing access to liquid funds. So if I have a bunch of stocks, there might come a time when I uh, want to buy a car or a house. I cannot pay for those in stocks, so I need to convert cash into stocks. Vice versa, I need to convert stocks into cash. So I need funding liquidity. And so that is why I get to sell my stocks. Once again, if the market knows that I am buying or selling stocks because I need either access to extra cash or vice versa, I have excess funds that I need to invest, then the market will not really change its valuation of the asset based on this information because these two reasons getting the risk profile and uh, needing or having access to cash are idiosyncratic to me personally they do not affect how profitable the asset actually is they do not affect the dividends or future price changes that this asset will bring the final reason, however, is different in this dimension. So different people might have... Um, so going back to the first line, in, in our view of the world, everyone would agree on the assets, future cash flows, conditional on the fundamentals. And the fundamentals here being um, state of the economy, state of the industry, whether COVID-19 is uh, raging out there, or whether there is a vaccine for it. So fundamentals are these basic pieces of knowledge around the world, uh, about the world. But thing is, is, different people might have different information about the fundamentals. So we all agree that uh, 
Zoom and Skype are very valuable in a quarantine world where nobody can work from office because uh, we need to maintain social distancing and because COVID-19 is out there. However, if COVID-19 is defeated and everyone goes back to the offices, then Zoom and Skype and Microsoft Teams and whatever Google is are not as valuable. So we agree on these two facts, on the dependence of value of these telecommunications uh, companies, telecommunications services companies, and uh, the state of the fundamentals, the state of uh, our fight with COVID-19. But we might have different information about what happens with COVID-19. I think there is a vaccine, you do not know there is a vaccine, or vice versa. This would lead us to disagree about the current expectations of the uh, assets value. This would mean that, just sticking with my uh, example, if I think that uh, we have defeated COVID-19 and you do not think that we have defeated COVID-19, then you will value Zoom and Skype uh, higher than I do. Because I know they are not worth as much because COVID-19 will soon be eradicated and so on. Right? So we disagree in our valuations of these stocks. So I have a reason to sell my stocks to you. My perception of value of these stocks is lower than yours. So this disagreement can be a value, it can be a reason for trading. However, unlike the other two reasons, if you actually knew why I was selling the stocks to you, so you know that I am selling the stocks to you because I know something about COVID-19 that you don't, then this knowledge would change your valuation for the asset. Unlike knowledge about my risk preferences and my liquidity stat status. Right? So this is a special thing about information. And we will dive deeper into it right now. Now, when we talk about information, the first thing that we need to accept, uh, the first thing that we need to emphasize is that there can be different kinds of information. So for our purposes, it makes sense to drive a split between public information and private information. Here by public information, we mean the information that is possessed by everyone in the society, in the market. And the thing about public information is that if some new piece of public information is, uh, ar is arrives, so for example, everyone in the world simultaneously announces that cure for COVID-19 is found, then asset prices might move without, a, without generating any trade. So if all of us, all of the, all of us traders, all of us investors, simultaneously learn that the cure for COVID-19 was found, then we all simultaneously drop our perceptions of value of the Zoom and Skype stocks. Right? We do not need to. We do not need any trade to incorporate this information into our valuations. We just do this re-evaluation in our heads. But all of our valuations change by the same amount because once again we are assuming that we all interpret information in the same way. So no new disagreement is generated by public announcements. Now at this point you might be thinking, if you know anything about the real world, that this is not actually how this works, right? And in reality, a lot of trade is actually generated by public information. And we will talk about that later in the course, in one of the lectures in part three of the course. But for now, we are staying in the 
classical economic paradigm and within the confines of this paradigm any new public information cannot actually generate new trade. Now speaking about private information, this is information that is possessed by some traders and not others. So this generates asymmetry of information in the market, in the society. And so if it is commonly agreed that some traders may have private information, then traders will observe everyone else's trades, each other's trades, because these trades will reveal this private information. So if you presume that I am more informed about the state of our battle with COVID-19, then you will make an inference from my decisions to trade. If I want to sell to you, it probably means that the stocks are worth less than you think. And vice versa, if I want to buy from you, then I might think that this is because the stocks are valued uh, higher than you think. Now, a point of order is to say that uh, there can be different definitions of private information. In particular, in the legal world, what is often assumed by private information is the insider information which is by definition on, can only avail let me try to say this again which by definition can only be available to some people and not others and uh, what who is commonly meant by insiders is workers of the company whose stocks we are trading in so managers or employees or counterparts or regulators so all the people who know what is happening inside the firm and thus have a better perspective of the future prospects of uh, this company's earnings. This information typically constitutes a trade secret. So it, uh, it, is, it is the protected knowledge of the company and uh, people outside of the company are not entitled automatically to know this information. Now the point of this conversation is that trading based on the insider information is illegal in most jurisdictions in the world. Meaning that if I'm the director of Skype. I know that we have uh, done a great breakthrough in video conferencing and uh, we have developed a new protocol which will bring perfect connection at ridiculously low bitrate, right? I want to buy our stocks because I know we have a breakthrough. I know that we will have a lot of earnings in the future. But this kind of transaction would be considered illegal because I am trading based of information that is not available to the general populace, to other market participants. So given that we will be considering effects of private information in markets, and given what I just said about insider trading, the question you want to ask is, well, why are we doing this? If it's illegal to trade based on insider information, then why are we looking at the effects of private information on markets? Well, one answer is that we are considering a counterfactual world and all of these models are meant to demonstrate why insider trading is illegal. And these models will show you what would happen if insider trading did actually take place in markets. But given the amount of time that we will devote to models with asymmetric information, this is not a uh, great description. This is not a great justification to devote that much time to this issue. So what we'll do is we will actually take a different interpretation of public and private information. And I'll call this the academic interpretation of private information. 
in this interpretation, we will be thinking that all information, both public and private, is in principle available for everybody. So it is publicly available and anyone who really wants to can get access to this information. But some agents are better than others at obtaining access to this information and analyzing it. So when we will be saying in the course that some trader has private information about the value of the asset, what we mean is that this agent has the same public information at his disposal, but has done a better analysis of this information and has a greater picture of um, the true valuation of the stock, has better information about the fundamentals. So this is what we shall mean. For example, you know, uh, it's not, this situation is not that difficult to imagine, especially in our digital world. I have access to all of Wikipedia and I have not read a one hundredth of a percent of it. So a lot of information is publicly available, but it does not mean that we incorporate all of this information in our decision making, in particular stock buying and selling decisions. So once again, uh, in our interpretations, people with private information, traders with private information, are those who are better at analyzing the information that is publicly accessible. Now let us ask ourselves, what is the connection between information and prices? How does information enter prices? Friedrich von Hayek, almost a century ago, has said, fundamentally, in a system in which the knowledge of the relevant facts is dispersed among many people, prices can act to coordinate the separate actions of different people. So, price, it is the purpose of prices to coordinate in the information, to incorporate all the information available in the, in the society and aggregate it. Eugene Fama then went even further, conjecturing what is now known as now known as efficient markets hypothesis, which claims that prices must be efficient. Now let's take a couple of minutes uh, to discuss this hypothesis. First of all, what does it mean for prices to be efficient? What, just what does it mean in general? We have done a small discussion in previous lectures on what efficiency means, and we argued that Prices are efficient when they enable the efficient allocation to arise in the society. In terms of Econ 101, an efficient price equalizes supply and demand. In our informational perspective, prices are efficient when they reflect all available information. However, depending on what exactly you mean by all available information, the hypothesis takes slightly different um, shadows of gray. In particular, there can be three different forms of efficiency, at least that those that we will look at. Weak form of efficiency means that prices reflect historic price information. So in this case, prices must be incorporating all the information that is contained in past prices, but it may ignore different um, other pieces of public or private information that are currently present in the society, in the market. A semi-strong form of efficiency requires that prices reflect all public information. So all information that is commonly known by market participants 
must be incorporated in the prices. Finally, the strongest of them all is the strong form, which requires that prices reflect all public and private information currently present in the society. So as soon as one person knows something, this knowledge should be reflected into prices immediately. And this might seem ridiculous, but strong form is actually the kind of efficiency that arises in the classical economic models. In particular, if you have ever seen general equilibrium theory models, such as the Edgeworth box, or Arrow Debris Securities, or Radner Equilibrium. If any of these names ring a bell, then you should know that in these models you had strongly efficient prices. If you have never heard those names, then do not worry. So there are different kinds of efficiency. And efficient markets hypothesis says that prices must be efficient, well, in at least some of them. But presumably it is often understood as prices must be strong form efficient. Let us discuss this. Let's discuss the problems with this hypothesis. So why it is a bad idea for prices to be strong form efficient? Well, first of all, it yields what is called a no-trade theorem. In particular, if traders have private information and they only care about the fundamentals, they should never trade. Because if I want to trade with you, you immediately take that as a signal that I have information about higher valuation of the asset. And you thus immediately incorporate this information into your own perception of the asset value. And thus you increase the price at which you are ready to sell me the asset to the point at which I no longer want to buy the asset from you. This is the mechanism behind the no-trade theorem. Any desire to trade becomes too informative and acts as basically a public signal, as a piece of public information that moves all agents' valuations and thus uh, renders any potential trade unprofitable. Obviously, this is not what we observe in the real world. There is a lot of trading and too much trading to uh, call it an exception. So no trade theorem is obviously violated and we want to understand why it does not hold if the efficient market hypothesis holds. Secondly, the efficient market hypothesis implies a Grossman-Stiglitz paradox. It says that if markets are informationally efficient in the strong form, then prices would reflect traders' private information. So, again, any piece of knowledge that any trader obtains is immediately incorporated in, in prices. But this implies that there are no incentives to acquire information. Right? Our interpretation of private information is that it is a inference from the whole pool of public knowledge. And you would think that this analysis, this inference process, is costly for whoever does this. Does this. So any trader who analyzes public information wants to get some profit from this analysis. And if there is no such profit, there is no incentive to acquire information, so nobody actually cares about prices being efficient. Right? No, nobody cares to learn what the asset is actually worth. And therefore, this information is not obtained, not incorporated into prices, and prices end up basically not being efficient. Because nobody cares to learn what the efficient level is. So this is another paradox produced by the efficient market hypo hypothesis. Finally, in the real world, prices move around a lot. Prices are very volatile. They can change 
by a few dollars within any given day, within any given hour, even within any given minute. And such volatility cannot be justified by public news alone. So it cannot be the case that there is some stream of public news that leads all agents to immediately reevaluate their valuation of the asset. There are just not enough news for that to happen. So what drives this volatility? If we believe in efficient market hypothesis, we have no explanation for this volatility. So all of these three factors tell us that maybe the efficient market hypothesis is not a great thing to assume because it leads to these three unexplained problems. And well, one of them is not a problem, but a paradox. But it's also as another problem. The efficient market hypothesis does not really tell us how the information gets incorporated into prices. It just says that any information available to the market is immediately incorporated into prices. But it's only reasonable to ask, how does this happen? And we have no response to that. So all of this tells us that efficient market hypothesis is not an assumption that we are willing to make. So we will not make this assumption. We will not take the efficient market hypothesis for granted. But instead, we will see whether it arises in our models endogenously, whether this is a result that we obtain. And if so, how it emerges and what exactly drives it. Now let's try to figure out uh, how everything that we've just talked about looks like in math. So in particular, how does this in connection between information market prices look like in math? Now let us denote information by this capital omega T. So this will be our notation for the market's public knowledge at time T. So all facts available and known by all market participants at time t. And everyone knows that everyone knows them, and everyone knows that everyone knows that everyone knows them, and so on. So there is common knowledge of the set of facts contained in omega t. Now we will assume that knowledge is cumulative, meaning that nothing is forgotten by the markets. But rather in every next period, t plus 1, the set of information, the set of these publicly known facts, is a superset of past knowledge. So, what you know at time t plus 1 consists of what you know, what you knew at time t, plus some new piece of knowledge that arrived since last period. So, i t plus 1 is the new information, it is the public news. Okay, so we know what knowledge is, we know what information is. How can we define the market value of the asset, which for now is not equal to the price, right? The two are only equal under the efficient market hypothesis. We are now interested in market valuation of an asset. So how much do agents in the market think the asset is worth given all public information. Now there are two approaches to looking at this. The first approach, the more fundamental one, is uh, the discounted cash flows or discounted present value approach. You may also know it as net present value approach. It tells us that market value of an asset at some given time t should be equal to an expectation of the future cash flows that this asset yields. So in particular, it is an expectation of the sum over all future periods. CS here is a cash flow in period S, so a future cash flow. And delta is a discount factor. So we discount future cash flows because they are worth less to us than current cash flows. 
And on top of that, CS, the future cash flows, is an uncertain variable. So we do not know how much the asset will yield us. But we can form an expectation of this cash flow conditional on our current knowledge omega t. So as I said, this is a more fundamental approach. In this course, we will take a more reduced form approach, um, which I will call a fundamental value approach. And we will say that there exists some objective fundamental value of the asset V. And you should think of this V is as um, if we knew exactly what all the future cash flows were, what all the fundamentals are, current and future, then the fair market valuation of an asset would be equal to V. However, since we do not exactly know all of these fundamentals, and we do not know the future perfectly, we have to take the expectation of this V. And this expectation is once again conditional on some body of knowledge given by omega t. So this is the approach that we will be taking throughout the rest of the course. We will be assuming that there is some objective fundamental value of the asset V. But we will assume that the public information about V is coarse. So at least some traders do not exactly know what this V is, but they only have some belief about how this V can be distributed. So now that we know what is market valuation of an asset, we can talk about what is the informational efficiency of the price. So what does it mean for prices to be efficient? In particular, it is in this notation easy to see that informational efficiency means that the price of the asset PT should be equal to the market valuation mu T. And once again, we represent this market valuation as a conditional expectation of some true fundamental value V, conditional on the market's public knowledge. Now here, the market's public knowledge, this omega T, is the public information, but it does not incorporate agents' private information. So this efficiency, this equality, is understood in this semi-strong sense. If this equality holds, price is semi-strong efficient. So in this world, the market valuation only changes if new information arrives. So if our omega t is not the same as omega t plus 1, if there is some new information that arrives from t to t plus 1. So let us say that epsilon t plus 1 is the innovation in market valuation between periods t and t plus 1. This is an innovation in value, and this epsilon is a random variable from the perspective of period t. So at time t, we do not know how the future price will change, how the future market value will change. And now let us look at what this innovation should be, what should be the property of this innovation. So let us try to calculate an expectation, the expected value of this innovation. So we'll take the expected value of epsilon t plus 1, conditional on our knowledge at time t, the omega t. Now we can re rewrite epsilon as the difference in mu's. Now expectation is a linear operator, so we can split this difference into the difference of two mathematical expectations. So we can rewrite this as expectation of mu t conditional on omega t plus 1 minus expectation of mu t conditional on omega t. However, the expectation of mu t conditional on omega t is just mu t, right? So in period t, 
we know exactly what market valuation is. We know exactly what mu t is. It is not a random variable from the perspective of period t. So we do not need this expectation in our second term. As for the first term, let us just use our definition of mu and plug it in here. What we will have is the expected value of the expected value of v, conditional on omega t plus 1, conditional on omega t. So we have two nested expectations, two iterated expectations. And what we can use here is the law of iterated expectations that you should know from your probability theory course. In particular, since omega t plus 1 is a contains strictly more information than omega t, the expectation of omega t plus 1 from the perspective of omega t is exactly omega t. So we do not know what the innovation is. We do not know what the innovation is uh, to v that will arrive in the next period because we do not know what the new information is just by the definition of new. But applying this law of iterated expectation to this nested expectation, you will obtain that it is actually equal to just the expectation of V conditional on omega t. If we are trying to guess the future expectation of V, our best guess for that is our current expectation of V. There is no reason for us to assume that our expectation of V will change. And if you want to know more about how this happens, look into a probability theory textbook. So we have obtained this expression. We see that the expectation of epsilon t plus 1 is given by expectation of v conditional on omega t minus mu t. But this first term is exactly the definition of mu. So this first term is equal to mu t, meaning that our expectation of epsilon t plus 1 conditional on omega t is given by mu t minus mu t, so 0, which is which tells you basically what I just said, right? So ep epsilon is our innovation in market valuation. And mu t is our best guess of what the fundamental value v is. So if we're trying to guess how our expectation of v will change in the future, the best guess we have is it won't. The best guess for our future estimate of v is our current estimate of v. This in particular has some implications. So with some extra math, you can also show that intertemporal correlation between the innovations to market valuation is zero. So the expectation of epsilon s times epsilon t is zero meaning that covariance between the two terms is zero. And if we say that prices are efficient in the semi-strong sense, meaning that if we assume that this equality holds, then our innovation in prices, the change in prices, is exactly the same as the innovation in market valuation, right? which means that our expectation of a change in prices is zero. Our best estimate of the future price of the asset is given by our current price of the asset. This is written by this equality. So if prices are efficient, at least in the semi-strong form, then price is what, a, is, what is called a martingale from the point of view of market participants, meaning that it does not change on average. It can go up, it can go down, but your best estimate of the future price 
is the current price. Now this is a one very popular implication of the informational efficiency and one assumption that is commonly made in asset pricing literature. So it is worth being familiar with and that is why I wanted to introduce it to you. So this concludes our general discussion of information and prices. And from this point onwards we will be working with, we will be introducing a particular model of trading under asymmetric information. This will be a model of Gloston and Milgram from 1985. And we will be talking about this in the second part of this lecture. And I hope to see you there.